Welcome back. Today we're going to have a look at how to construct a histogram in views. Histograms are common tools for displaying the distributions of data and is essentially constructed as a bar chart where the bars run into each other and we'll talk about why that is as we construct the histogram. So with that, let's just jump right in and have a look at how to do this. I've already opened up a views file and preloaded data. We're going to look at stock market returns. The data looks something like this, where I have the S&P 500 year and then the returns. Again, these are the fractional returns for each year, not the percentage returns, but we can convert that later. The NASDAQ year, the NASDAQ return, and the Dow year, and the Dow year return. So we have data for three different stock indices for the times over which this data has been recorded. If I go in, I could try to make a histogram for one of these simply by going into our graph widget and then clicking on the histogram of a data set. Then we have under the properties window, bin data set. This is going to tell us what data we're trying to divide up into our histogram. We don't want the years, we want the returns. So how about the S&P 500 returns? When I click on this, I get something that looks a lot like a histogram automatically. Most of the time when I see something where the data runs right up to the edge, it does make me a little nervous to think I might be missing something. So I'm going to widen this X axis a little bit. We also want to work in terms of percentage maybe because that's how people oftentimes think about returns instead of fractional returns. So let's just multiply the scale by 100 so that we can work in percent return. Then I can make this run from minus 100 to 100. And that might frame it symmetrically about zero in a way that people normally like to think about these stock market returns. Back to the histogram. What can I do here? Well, I could add weights, which we're not going to worry about here. But for instance, we might have wanted to count something more than once, and we could specify how to do that here. We can talk about how we want to calculate this, because again, all that we've done is we have pointed this widget at a column of data that has a series of numbers, and then it has binned together these numbers for us. And so this controls how that binning is done and how we calculate. Right now, it's simply just counted the number of items per bin. But instead of that, I could have the fraction. Or instead of that, I could have the density. The density is basically just the probability, let's say, that we would fall into one of these bins. I could also have counts cumulative, which means that I rise all the way to 100%. This isn't how we normally think about a histogram but it can sometimes be useful to plot things like this, where it is cumulative. We can also go cumulative reverse, where we look at everything and then it falls off. But let's go back to density. Or actually, let's go back to counts. Counts probably makes the most sense. Under binning, we have several options for how we divide things up. One is constant. If we specify constant, then we need to give it a number of bins. You can see that if I start increasing the number of bins, I basically get finer and finer resolution in here. It might be a little hard to see what's going on, so let's actually stop for a moment and go to our formatting. In a histogram, normally it's just a series of bars that run into each other at the edges of the bins, and this is in part what separates a histogram from a bar chart. A bar chart plots discrete categories and then the size of each of those categories. A histogram divides up a continuous line into chunks and then plots the density of points or the number of points in each one of those chunks. And so those chunks are the widths of the bars. Here it's hard to see because we can't see what those where those bars are. Under the formatting for histogram, the way we can turn that on is go to post line, 
Right now it's hidden, but I will click unhide and then set this to black. Now you see the individual bars and you can see I have one, two, there's just nothing here, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have ten bars. One of them just doesn't have any data. And when I look here, I see I have 10 bars when I calculate um, binning in a constant manner. Here's 11, 12, 13. So now you can see that I'm increasing the number of bars as I increase the number here. Constant means that each width is constant. And so every bar has the same width. This still looks a little funny because we see these bars in the middle, but no bars across the top as we're used to seeing. That's actually handled with this line here. So I'm gonna go ahead and also change that. We'll come back and talk about these, but if I add that in, it looks a little bit more like how we're used to seeing a histogram plot. Great. What else could we do? Returning to binning, instead of constant, I could say manual, and then I would need here to type in where the bins are. I could go to auto and then it will try to decide what it thinks the best binning is rather than me specifying it. I could go to FD, which is just another way of binning. These are the different types of bins and binning algorithms that we could use to try to decide how many bins we should have. This is just, for instance, the square root of the number of points equals the number of bins we have. I usually just decide how many bins I need to have and then specify that manually. 20 is probably a pretty good one, but we could use any of our different formulas that we have for specifying the number of bins and then type that into here. We also have minimum and maximum, that's auto, but that basically specifies where we want to start and stop counting. So I said zero, now I'm just going to bin the data from zero over instead of binning the entire set. Again, there might be a reason you want to exclude a certain amount of data, but I think for now, just having auto is fine. Something else I could do though, is say minus 100 to 100. And now what I've done is I've put 20 bins between minus 100 and 100. I only see two here. And the reason is that the data doesn't really run from minus 100 to 100. It looks like it does because I have scaled the X by 100. Instead, the data as I have it, that span minus 100 to 100 is really the same as minus one to one because we haven't multiplied it yet. And now I have 20 bins that run that same range. And now each bin falls evenly on an interval of 10. So each bin now counts up 10% return. So 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. So that's one way if we wanted the bins to look kind of nice like this, that we could handle that, is that we could specify the minimum and the maximum that way. This also solved one problem for us. If I go back to auto, you'll see that it doesn't draw a line at the very edge. And the reason is because it's cutting off right at the edge of our data. And so this helps us do that, but can also yield, if we're smart about our range and the number, even looking bars between these. Because I have such even looking bars, I probably don't need these minor tick marks and we know how to get rid of that, which maybe we don't need to do right now, but that would probably improve the look of this a little bit. What else can we do? We can assign what is our X axis, which is this X axis. We can uh, talk about the uncertainty if we want, which we don't need to explore at this point in time. We can change the direction to horizontal, although I typically like my histograms to be vertical. And then we have bin scaling. So now we've told it I want 20 bins from minus 100 to 100, and the bin scaling is linear, which basically means that each one is gonna be the same. I could, to exponential, let's go to exponential. And what we can see is now, the size of the bin exponentially depends on what its position is. And so the bins are no longer even spacings. I think that there are times where it's really important to be able to apply uneven spacings.
For instance, if you're doing spectroscopy and you need to apply a Jacobian transformation. However, most of the time, this is not what we want. And instead, linear is going to serve us much better. So let's just leave it there. And then finally, we can specify the y-axis. With that out of the way, now that we've looked at the properties window, we can return to the formatting window. Our main options are to select the color. For instance, maybe I want this to be dark cyan, which is a color I think looks nice. The style is step, but I could have it be join. What's the difference? Join basically doesn't draw horizontal areas or horizontal transitions. I think that there are times where you might want it to look like this, but for the most part, the regular step looks better and is easier for people to interpret. Here, what we've done is we have now transitioned so that the length of this line is the actual value. And then we've just connected between lines. When I go back to step, you'll notice that this line moves to the edge because we're outlining a box. We could have markers if we want for some reason, and then that could put markers at the positions of the top. Again, I'm not sure that we need this necessarily, but it might be that you like to have something like that on your plots. For now, let's just say none. Of course, if we had markers, we could change its size. We could control whether we're showing error bars, which would be a reason to have markers if we had error on these. We don't have error because we're just counting how many times a certain number appears. Under line, we can control this outline. So instead of black, for instance, we could have white. I don't really like the way white looks. And so let's just keep it as black. Of course, we could have gray and things like that. We can control the width if we want so that it's more bold or not. We could even hide it if we just wanted these interior lines. But I think by and large, just keeping it consistent with the lines in the middle is a better idea. We could of course change as always how it looks in terms of its style and we could make it transparent. Here we have the fill. That's the fill of each one of these bars. Right now the mode is to zero, which is the same as saying under because our Y axis goes to zero. If instead our Y axis went to, let's say minus 10, you could see that below fills up everything. Whereas if we had two zero, it would just fill two zero. So there might be times where that's what you want to see. I'm going to go back and just set this to zero. We could also fill over if we want. And now we could have something filled with these white bars underneath. And so those are your options. Let's just keep it at two zero. We can have a different style, for instance, crossed. And then of course we have all the control that we've come to expect over this pattern. But we're gonna just leave this at zero. We could choose to hide it. We could choose to make it transparent. We could also choose to hide an error fill, but since we don't have errors, that has not appeared. We have the same sort of fill options here. So let's unhide this and the cyan is now filling over, but this could be dark red, for instance. And now I have cyan against dark red. I could change the style just like we did with anything else. I don't really think that we need this, even though that is very dramatic looking. Let's just keep it hidden. These were the bars in the middle, which are treated as lines. So we have all the control over them we would normally expect. We can make them thicker or thinner. We can change their style so they're dashed or dotted if you like that. I'm gonna keep them solid. We can change their transparency or hide them. Lastly, we have a few options if we had chosen to show markers where we can control the outline and the fill of those markers as well as how the errors look if we were showing things like error bars. But again, we don't have error here and we've chosen not to show the markers. When we explored the properties and behaviors of scatter plots, we really explored what we could do with the marker border or outline and the marker fill. And so we're not going to cover that here, but just know that if back in the main window, you had chosen to have some sort of marker shown, perhaps as an octagon, let's say, you could control all of the different aspects of that as well using the formatting windows that are here to control things like its fill. 
Okay, and with that, now we know how to make a histogram in views. You should be able to now make histograms of whatever data you think might be useful to make a histogram of. And so with that, go out and have fun making some histograms out of your data.